We're going to tell a story tonight of a group of people who resisted Nazism. They were called the Red Orchestra, but they were not an orchestra. They were a politically and religiously diverse group of people, and most of them were not members of the Communist Party. As their story unfolds, we will see how this group came together and coalesced around resistance activities, and we'll learn how they came to be called red or communists. So let's start by setting the scene and tell us briefly what was life like for German civilians in Germany while the Nazis were in power and while Nazi forces were conquering and occupying most of Europe. Yeah, um, I think when the, German, when the Nazis took power, it was such a chaotic period. And there had been all kinds of street demonstrations and political violence. So once that stopped, everybody kind of took a breath and looked around. And the people I'm writing about were liberals, they were progressives, and they thought, surely this Nazi business won't last. It'll blow over, people will come to their senses. And then after two or three years, it became apparent that it wasn't blowing over. They were really becoming entrenched. By the time the Nazis invaded Poland, uh, these anti-Nazi Germans living in Germany were starting to take desperate measures to, to try to undermine the regime. So, so their attitude really changed over those six years between 33 and 39. Could you give us an idea of that change? What kind of activities were they doing first and how did that develop? Well, in 33, they were, both, they were basically trying to survive. So, for example, Mildred and Arthur Harnap, who were academics who'd been in, at the University of Wisconsin, went to the countryside and basically stopped anything that could be interpreted as any kind of political activity and laid low. And after a few years, Arthur Harnap decided he had to really do something to fight the Nazis. So he joined the party and infiltrated the economics ministry and started giving intelligence to both the Americans and the Soviets. Okay. <clears throat> um, so the, the Nazis created this monolithic, tightly controlled society um, where you couldn't trust anyone and uh, the presence of the police or the Gestapo was all pervasive. But beneath, I'm quoting now from the book, beneath the frozen surface of the fascist society, as stubborn as a mushroom ring underground, was the small universe of the circle, the circle. Overlapping circles of interlocking relationships with aims that were subversive to the regime. The Red Orchestra was one such circle. Can you tell us how this circle Developed. How did these people come together and who was in it? Yeah, it started with a few students who'd been in Wisconsin together. And they were united by their anti Nazi sentiments. And so they would each start to recruit people that they knew in various forms of their life. Maybe they'd be family members, co workers, neighbors. And the groups would be overlapping circles. So if I knew you because you lived in my building, you might bring somebody that you knew from your kid's school, but I wouldn't necessarily know the people you knew. And by the time they got involved in very serious resistance activities, like anti-Nazi flyers, it was very important that they not know each other. So one person might write an anti-Nazi pamphlet, another person would type it on an illegal typewriter, Another person would wear gloves and put it in envelopes, and yet another person would put it in the mailboxes. Why was it so dangerous to distribute flyers? Punishable by a concentration camp and sometimes death. And these flyers were very outspoken. They would say, Germans unite against the SS murderers. And, you know, Germany war crimes are being committed in your name rise up against the Nazi oppressors. So they were not subtle. Uh, and it really drove the stuff up crazy because they would collect them and try to trace them. And this group, the Red Orchestra, was really very good at hiding their tracks. And tell us about 
some of the people were distributing some, uh, and brought some uh, cards with little biographical sketches of some of the couples who were in this group. I think that one of the interesting characteristics of this group was that there were many married couples in it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so tell us about some of these couples and what, what were they resisting and how did they do it? Well, one thing we remember is the Nazis took a fairly dim view of professional women. And so a lot of the women in these couples were uh, professional women of every possible uh, profession. Um, one of them was a fashion model who worked in the salon where Ava Braun bought her clothes. And uh, so they, they served all of the Nazi wives. And she would go as a fashion model to different capitals of Europe and have intelligence in her hat box. Um, so they, they had these amazing uh, lives. But more typical was Mildred Karnak, who was an American, and Greta Kukov, who were both professors. They were both academics. And um, I think they were feminists. They were involved in the civil rights movement in the United States. They were horrified by anti-Semitism. Both of them had very close friends their entire lives who were Jewish, and they just didn't understand anti-Semitism. And so they both objected to it and worked against it and went to great, great lengths to help their Jewish friends. Can you give us some examples of that? Yeah. Um, one of the things that this group did quite consistently was help their Jewish friends get illegal documents, forged documents, illegal foreign currency, because as the Nazi regime went on, it became harder and harder to leave Germany. And they were charging more and more money. It was harder to get exit permits and visas out. So Mildred Harnack and Greta Kukov both went to England and helped set these, these immigration routes up for them. And um, there's evidence, there's historical evidence of what they did. There was a Jewish publisher named Max Taub who got out uh, to, to Norway after Kristallnacht and survived the war, and he gave the Mildred and Arvid Harnack credit for helping him escape and saving his life. And I was able to interview several of the Jewish survivors who were helped by these people. And what was Arvid Harnack doing in the government? He was an economist, and so he was very high up in the economics ministry, and he was able to get very, very sophisticated economic intelligence to use against the Nazis. So he decided to really focus on that area. He felt that's where he could hurt them the most. How about the Schultz Boysens? Well, the Schultz Boysens were the glamour couple of the group. Harold Schultz Boysen was a, a German Air Force lieutenant, and Gehring had given him a job as a favor to his family, which was very prestigious. Um, and he was in Air Force Intelligence reading all of the reports from the ministries abroad. So he had very, very high level intelligence as well. His wife was the granddaughter of a prince. So she was an aristocrat and she was educated in Swiss boarding schools and lived in Paris. And she had joined the Nazi party early on, or the Bundeutsches Mädel, which was the girls' organization. But she turned against the Nazis when she married Harrow. And she had some of the most fascinating activities in the group. She loved the movies and wrote screenplays and worked for the, the uh, Goebbels propaganda ministry in the documentary division. And when soldiers came in from the Eastern Front, from Russia and Poland, she would flirt with them. She was very pretty. And they would give her photographs of atrocities as kind of a way of uh, boasting, it seems. And she made copies to prepare as an archive to use in war crimes prosecutions in the future. Do you know a 